Definitely informal. Um, Shenzhen is all about informality. <laughs> so, uh, we'll try to keep it at that. Um, thank you, Laila. Thank you very much. And um, thanks, uh, thanks, Joshua and Oning and Adam Frampton for, and all of you for, for coming out to this, um, this presentation of Joshua's book and, uh, and, and, of, uh, and of the book that I um, co-edited and helped co-author. Um, uh, I, I'm the only one of the three co-editors uh, here um, because one of them lives in Shenzhen and one of them lives uh, in California. Um, so I, I humbly want to acknowledge that and, uh, and to thank them, Marianne O'Donnell uh, and Winnie Wong, um, and all the contributors uh, to the book. So um, I'm just going to talk uh, in general about the book briefly and then uh, give you a bit of an overview of it. Then we'll move to Joshua and then... Uh, Adam, and then we'll open up for discussion. So um, I think there are actually some images here, but I didn't. Uh, is that? Um, thanks. Here they are down here, I think. Um, yeah, actually. Play from start. OK. Well, yeah, these are just supposed to. Just, these are just going to be rotating in the background uh, every 10 seconds or so. Um, so a long time ago now, um, two famous models in China under Mao Zedong, the agricultural and industrial collectives known as Dajai and Daqing communities, communes, were supposed to showcase the collective spirit necessary to surpass England and catch up with the United States. At the end of the Cultural Revolution in the 1970s, this rallying call to surpass England and catch up with the United States sounded entirely hollow. But in the 30 years following, the People's Republic of China has thoroughly reversed that history of economic failure under a continued rule of the Communist Party, and it offers a startling proof of this, the city of Shenzhen. The authors of this volume, some of whom live in Shenzhen, others who are drawn to the city, share a fascination with this Potemkin village made real. What, we wonder, made possible this statistical wonder that inverts earlier models? How did Shenzhen come to play a central role in cementing the legitimacy of the post-Mao Chinese party state? With Shenzhen, the party state has arguably achieved an economic liberalization far beyond what Western-led neoliberal global institutions have managed in the post-socialist countries of Eastern Europe. How should we understand this phenomenon? The authors in this volume and the editors, myself, are acutely aware that those who emphasize the achievements of China's post-Mao economic reinvention tend to see Shenzhen through rose-colored glasses and see it as a site of veritable successes. Conversely, those who focus on the thorny problems of global capitalism in an authoritarian political system focus, uh, tend to regard Shenzhen as a site of its worst abuses. And in Chinese political discourse, by the 30-year anniversary of Shenzhen, Shenzhen had become the poster city for, their, for the success of official planning and policies. They had model leaders, model workers, model villages, model industries, model institutions, and model governance are evident everywhere, rhetorically, in Shenzhen today. So what this volume tries to do is to seek to untangle the utopian and dystopian strains running through the representations of the city, the city of more than 20 million people. We broadly concur with the idea that it is an amazing achievement, that Shenzhen serves as a pivotal case study from which important lessons can be learned. Yet our analysis differs from the official story of the Shenzhen miracle, because that narrative tends to elide the actual factors and the agents of reform in that miracle, which we seek to bring back into the story. So while the official perspective lauds the model as the logical result of coherent policies and plans, we argue that nothing of that sort took place. In fact, the model emerged out of a period of illicit and sometimes outright politically unapproved experimentation, which itself allowed for a series of exceptions to the model's own policies. 
These results were later cannily re-inscribed after the fact into the officially sanctioned and newly invented narratives about the city and then extended to other places. So in the book, we aim to highlight the shifting elements of socialism and capitalism that constantly recombine in Shenzhen's history. Rather than privileging party state-led policies or the raw hand of the global market, our book focuses instead on the processes by which the construction of the Shenzhen zone and then model emerged. How, we ask, were the agents of reform transformed into model subjects of the new order? How did the post-Mao appropriation of capitalist logics lead to a dramatic remodeling of the dominant institutions and discourses of the socialist planning era? Oops, I think the thing just stopped. I was, I can just keep it in the background. So Shenzhen, as most of you probably know, was founded as a special economic zone, SEZ, in 1979, not long after the American architectural theorists had promoted Las Vegas as a new model for architectural design and urban development. When Beijing sought to loosen central planning policies inside the newly created SEZ, this also unintentionally echoed the Americans' call in learning from Las Vegas for an architecture without architects, a city in which the withdrawal of social planning, design, and control could allow the emergent and chaotic features of capitalist environments and small-scale everyday heroism to take shape. Shenzhen is thus in some ways a supreme paradox of planning. It's held up as a pinnacle of planning, but its success lies in those spaces where planning for all intents and purposes fails. These spaces are the borders that are the precondition for Shenzhen. The borders between Shenzhen and Hong Kong, the border between Shenzhen and the mainland, often known as the second line, um, the borders between legally urban and legally rural spaces, borders between class, borders between people from the inside and from the outside, people um, with hukou versus people without hukou, all kinds of visible and invisible borders. And Shenzhen's spatial politics center on facilitating and controlling movement across these various kinds of borders. And the people of Shenzhen have developed extraordinarily complex socio-technical machineries, if you will, to regulate, evade, evoke, and provoke the movement across its very bordered spaces, whether the movement of money, of products, of people, of labor, or of ideas. So the cases in this book, which I will explain in the moment and then end, reveal how a certain looseness in the policing of boundaries, to put it mildly, or an ineptitude in certain forms of governance, is in fact the crucial mechanism of Shenzhen's dynamic growth. Our analyses show that for boundaries to function as value-producing mechanisms, they must both be ideologically firm and functionally blurry. In particular, the book focuses on three forms of spatial production. Bound, um, borders, citizenship status, as in Hukou, and rural urbanization, since so much of Shenzhen uh, was rural uh, and then found itself inside the newly created city. These three forms of borders, of citizenship status, and rural urbanization we argue, mediate the city's political and vernacular geography of creating value through exploiting difference. The book details the progression of Shenzhen from experiment to official model. It's not an encyclopedic overview, uh, but it is loosely chronological. It contrasts the early experimental period, roughly 1978 to 1995, during which the state was often an absent presence with the period of urban consolidation, roughly from 1995 to the present, where the party state apparatus increasingly intervenes in micro-level social change and appropriates the city's stunning economic success into larger national political narratives. The book is divided into three parts, experiments, exceptions, and extensions. Experiments begins with the ideological separation of politics and economics that positioned the zone as a target of governmental strategy and starts by situating the city's very emergence against the backdrop of two genealogies of 
the special economic zone. One, as a site of economic planning that enhances the accumulation of capital, and the second as a version of the imagined modern rational city with its inherent civilizing mission. The shifting relationship between economics and politics is made manifest in Shenzhen's early years when political reforms were often thwarted and erased, becoming a case study of how experimentation in the early years often meant, in the first instance, strategic failure. The new city's urban planning apparatus also had to embrace strategic failure as a way of acknowledging difficult realities on the ground and the need to diverge from national policy. One of these very difficult realities on the ground was the massive influx of migrant workers. And the section ends by detailing the shift from model leaders to model workers in the 1990s that prefigures a larger national shift in worker subjectivity as labor became increasingly commodified. We see thus by the end of the section how party-led campaigns, how state-run media, and migrant worker written narratives themselves, uh, like the world of Dagong, comes to operate together to forge a new consciousness through concepts such as Shenzhen's spirit. The second group of essays, Exceptions, focuses on how the models discussed in the first part create and constitute exceptional spaces from the borders themselves to the formerly rural areas now located within the cities. We focus especially on the complex political and cultural geography of what are known as urban villages, or uh, urbanized villages, perhaps more appropriately, which we argue are the fulcrum of Shenzhen's urbanization. These quasi-informal and quasi-legal communities are um, points of tension between the official world and village approaches to gray areas. They're a significant source of Shenzhen's ambiguity as a city defined by its gradations, gradations between licit and illicit, between formal and informal, between success and failure, between rural and urban. And this is especially true in the villages that straddle Shenzhen's political borders, the Sino-British Sino border to Hong Kong in the south, and, uh, and the so-called second line to the rest of the mainland in the north. The section ends by taking us into the lives of the most marginalized of Shenzhen migrants, female migrant sex workers, whose day-to-day -day existence is shaped by socioeconomic inequality and the structural violence of rural to urban migration, as well as by a version of the desire for urban belonging. The third and final part, extensions, follows the Shenzhen model from its early construction of model leaders, model workers, model villages, and citizens to its contemporary form of the city as a model, boasting model industries, model infrastructures, and model professions. And indeed, all around the world, from India to Africa, you often have the invocation of Shenzhen as a model uh, for uh, different forms of uh, export-led and zone-led uh, development. This idea of the city as a model entails mutually referential negoti negotiations with the global. Shenzhen becomes a model for the world through modeling itself after international examples. So we look in this section, for example, at cases from the creative industries by looking at workers in the infamous Dafan oil painting village, uh, at public health through the way in which the Shenzhen municipality attempted to deal with the H1N1 flu pandemic known as the bird flu by creating a model based on the US model of the Center for Disease Control, and uh, a really fascinating uh, chapter on transport infrastructure, looking at the informal check-in terminals that allow passengers in Shenzhen to check in for flights departing from Hong Kong International Airport. And unlike a very uh, glorious uh, international and empty international wing of Shenzhen's uh, airport. Uh, these check-in counters are located in storefronts, in shipyards, and in border crossings. These cases underscore Shenzhen's increasing concern with the visibility of its model and the mobilization of the city's discourse of exceptionalism. Ironically, we argue, the more Shenzhen presents itself as model for others, the more it erases and marginalizes the diverse local histories and the very spaces, people, practices, and processes that were central to its development. So the title of the book, Learning from Shenzhen, 
echoes the slogans around a classic feature of socialist governance, like the models mentioned at the start of these remarks. Learn from Da Jai, learn from Da Qing. It also, of course, echoes the title of that famous book from the 1970s, Learning from Las Vegas, which provocatively at the time saw the liminal space of the Las Vegas Strip as a new model for architectural design and urban development, as a site for reconfiguring socioeconomic relations through urban space. Although this is not a book about Shenzhen's architecture, we consider architects and urbanists among the stakeholders in China's historic experiment who can and should and must speak to the interactions we explore between individual agents and governmental apparatuses, between foreign or migrant workers and local hukou holding citizens. Other Chinese cities particularly Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, have longer and more politically significant international and cosmopolitan interactions. And other city regions, such as Xiamen, Chongqing, or Jiangsu, Delta, have been equally influenced by foreign investment and ideas. But Shenzhen remains unique within China's post-Mao history as a place where the central government's early tolerance of informal and illicit practices loosely confined within a variably administered space, created an excess of capital, of knowledge, and of imaginaries that extended beyond Shenzhen and into the rest of China and beyond. So what you'll find in the book is the city as a shifting subject, refusing easy incorporation into meta-narratives of economic development, urban planning, or neoliberalism. One of the book's main points is that the city cannot be seen as a linear development from plan to policy to execution. There are many grand narratives that can be used to explain Shenzhen. But whichever narrative one chooses, each of the authors and each of the cases finds in their own way that the crucial moments happened either much later or much earlier than would be expected or did not happen in a way that accorded with a plan or with theory or held a very different significance from, from a highly local perspective than for an outside observer with hindsight. Shenzhen then appears in this book as a condensed and instructive example of contemporary global modernity where modernity is a force that relentlessly pursues standardization yet generates the very vernacular forms that it seeks to banish. We hope in this book to show how Shenzhen contributes to the ongoing reconfiguration of the meaning of collective life in China, along with the reconfiguration of global economic and urban space, for which Shenzhen is both emblematic and enigmatic. Thank you. Jonathan, just uh, transition with you. Okay, so I think you got a great insight into uh, Shenzhen and what goes on in Shenzhen, both politically and from uh, an, a cultural and anthropological uh, viewpoint. Um, um, can I start the auto? I don't want it on auto. It seems to be doing itself automatically. Sorry.
Sorry about that. It just would be incredibly impossible to move the slides when I wanted to, so it would pose some difficulties. This book is not about Shenzhen. It's about Hong Kong. It's about the Hong Kong side of the border and particularly about the frontier closed area. Uh, the book is full of ideas. It tries to reclaim a space uh, for the architect as uh, a conceptual uh, strategist in terms of urban planning. Most uh, architects now don't get involved in large-scale urban planning and it really sets out an agenda for how architects can, can begin to contribute uh, to thinking and about uh, tactical interventions within uh, complex urban areas. So Hong Kong's border with Shenzhen is dissolving. By 2047, 50 years after the 1997 handover, the border will most likely no longer exist. This will mean the conjoining of the economic, uh, political, and social systems that have so far been able to operate distinctly under the one country, two systems policy. Hong Kong will become fully integrated into mainland China, or will it? The uncertainty surrounding what will actually happen, which is still unknown, has created huge anxiety for many Hong Kongers concerned about preserving cultural difference, language, and values, as well as freedom of speech and their right to vote. This was brought to the fore, as you see here, during 2014's Umbrella Revolution, initiated as a protest against Beijing's assertion that universal suffrage could only occur from a limited number of pre-selected candidates. However, Beijing has been adamant that the high degree of autonomy of the Hong Kong SAR, the Special Administrative Region, is not an inherent power, but one that comes solely with the authorization by the central leadership. And over the last uh, couple of years, we've seen these infractions of how Beijing has begun to assert its control uh, into the mainland, politically the notion of the booksellers, uh, where the abduc uh, they, which they were abducted for uh, selling certain controversial news media, as well as the kidnapping of um, a billionaire from uh, the, was it the Shangri-La? But the Shangri-La in Hong Kong. So again, this is the point where Beijing is asserting its control uh, into Hong Kong. Now caught within this debate is the frontier closed area. This is a buffer zone. Uh, which was created by the British in 1951 to strengthen Hong Kong's separation from the mainland. It was created after uh, uh, the British uh, showed allegiance to the Americans during the Korean War, and as a result, they begin to uh, militarize uh, this border, effectively creating DMZ uh, along the line of the river uh, between the mainland and um, Hong Kong. Today, too, it is being erased, and with it, over 2,000 hectares of land are being opened up for future uses. For 60 years, this closed land has remained a landscape of ecosystems, including tidal estuaries, fish farms, primary forests, historic villages, and abandoned military posts. In stark contrast, in just half the time, the village of Shenzhen across the border has exploded into an urban metropolis, which people now say is over 20 million, with some of the, the nuances and some of the issues that uh, Jonathan was uh, discussing, particularly in his book. The future planning of the FCA exists at this critical juncture in the future unfolding of the political and economic relationships uh, between Hong Kong and the mainland and ultimately in the acceptance or rejection of a conjoined Hong Kong and Shenzhen metropolis. The site is contested by uh, numerous stakeholders, including environmental uh, conservation lobbyists, uh, the powerful rural committee uh, that are pushing the development interests of local villages. When the FCA cre was created, this buffer effectively trapped uh, villages uh, within the zone, preventing them from developing their land. And many of these villages who had kinship relationships in Shenzhen uh, 
uh, were very upset that they couldn't see how their land could be turned into economic wealth compared to their um, families over the border in Shenzhen. Uh, there are the stakeholders, of course, outside investors from both Hong Kong and the mainland, and of course, government pressure to uh, supply housing. And in this instance, we would argue that typical modes of land use planning, including parceling off the land and zoning regulations, do not take into account the kind of complexity of the border as a kind of contradictory site of both separation and exchange, or the specific and synthetic landscape that exists uh, within the frontier closed area. The border explores this unique ecology of this intermediary zone, incorporating the specific narratives and their spatial effects <coughs> that have evolved through the changing relationships and these dynamic fluctuations politically and economically between Hong Kong and the mainland. We want to reveal this kind of complex set of relationships that operate between the kind of macro policies and also these micro conditions on the ground. Design strategies are insertions within this, of, uh, within this ecology, offering alternate forms of development that are open-ended to adjust to the region's unknown political future. The book is structured along the FCA and has these different chapters that go from uh, Deep Bay in the west all the way to the, the east. Um, and we have uh, uh, six chapters focusing on different themes that have emerged from our fieldwork in those specific locations. Enclaves and codependency, which deal with the contrast between an aquaponic fish pond landscape and enclaves of suburban residential development. Inbetweeners, which deals with this, the notion of a kind of in-betweener identity of a population that go between and cross the border daily. Interstitial infrastructure, which deals with the potential to embed um, a third space, a mutual beneficial zone of infrastructure between the two sides. Scarred landscapes, which deals with the flow of goods and materials and the scarring of the ground that occurs as a result of those border flows. Uh, invisible exchanges, which deals with these micro uh, border crossings so that uh, farmers within Shenzhen can still cross into Hong Kong to use their farmland through a tiny portal uh, within the border. And Kinship Economics and Village Alliances, which really talks about some of the early uh, variations of the border, namely uh, Chongming Street in um, uh, Xiao Tao Kok, which was uh, a kind of a border zone which allowed exchange between uh, China and um, the, the British colony. So I want to just highlight two of these chapters and give you a little bit of an insight into the methodology and the approach uh, that we've um, taken. Uh, the westernmost site at Deep Bay uh, reveals a kind of extreme contrast between the kind of wetland landscape and these uh, islands of suburban residential enclaves. Now, this landscape has, under, uh, has historically gone through multiple transformations through the changing uses of agricultural practices on the land. However, at this moment, this has stagnated, and the fish ponds are currently artificially supported uh, through government subsidies. The land uh, caught between uh, type, these two different types of enclaves becomes trapped and becomes very vulnerable uh, for abuses by developers and villagers who then try and uh, inf uh, encourage the process of degradation to these kind of trapped parcels of land so that they can create an argument to re-designate the land uh, for future um, development so that the land can be argued for new new housing models. Uh, in, our, uh, in our work in interviewing with uh, the, the people who manage these fish pounds, we learned that they had their own network of cooperation. So that each of the fish ponds, although managed by individuals, they relied on each other to move water from one fish pond to the other to either refill the water or empty it in order to harvest the fish. So the idea uh, in this case was to try and uh, 
build off this network of exchange and turn the fish ponds itself into a kind of network of aquaponic systems. And the proposal was instigating a kind of a new mechanism of exchange between the fish ponds uh, and also the enclaves. So we're trying to create new borders or new forms of exchange that could mutually benefit the fish pond owners as well as the people that were living in the uh, enclaves themselves. This created exchange between the residential management companies and also the villagers, thereby offering an alternative to the publicly funded wetland uh, compensation scheme. So here we see how we begin to work with the edge of the enclave and the edge of the fish farm to try and create facilities that could benefit the residents but also create uh, cooperative ownership uh, within this area so that it wouldn't just become um, a new development and could begin to reinstate the ecology uh, of these fish farms. You can see that we're just about that this land is already being degraded because it's no longer filled with water or operating as a wetland. And the reason why the government is compensating, of course, is this is a protected area. It's in the MIPO uh, um, WWF. It's a Ramsar site for uh, bird wildlife that has only become recently uh, into a kind of protected, well, since the 1980s, into a kind of protected zone because it's encouraging this new migration of uh, rare birds. So this is our kind of uh, proposition. In a different uh, chapter, we really we look at uh, this idea of in-betweeners. Every day, there are over 500,000 passenger border crossings uh, between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, the majority via rail, interchanging at the Lot Ma Chao or Lo Wu checkpoints. Over 60% of these travelers originate from Hong Kong, and a proportion of uh, this number is made by people who cross the border more than once a day for the purposes of uh, informal trading. One individual uh, was reported to have crossed the border 26 times in a single day. And these parallel traders are exploiting a legal loophole. They buy in-demand goods from Hong Kong and sell them uh, on the mainland. And this is how what we see in one of the, the first uh, stations on the Hong Kong side this is where the informal parallel trading begins. They load up with goods, they board the train, they go across, um, uh, across the border, and then they sell their goods informally. And the types of project, products range from um, um, uh, wine or even, uh, or most, and one of the majority of the products is, is actually milk powder due to the, um, the famous uh, disaster and the melatonin. Uh, was it melamine or melatonin? Melamine that created uh, death in, in, in the mainland. But this parallel trade is basically, um, we began to observe and trail uh, the people responsible and find out how their uh, systems and logistics were actually operating. And of course, the scale of trade that was taking place uh, would be a huge taxable amount. But because they do it as individuals, they're able to get uh, uh, avoid that um, taxation and create this kind of legal uh, loophole. Another unique group of these cross-border commuters are school children who navigate the border daily to attend school in Hong Kong. Their numbers have increased from just under 1,000 in 1999 to over 16,000 in 2012, and a predicted number by some of over 80,000 uh, in, in 2017. They're Hong Kong citizens, uh, usually with one uh, PRC parent with no right to abode in Hong Kong and therefore live uh, in Shenzhen. These kids, though, don't have a local hukou in Shenzhen and so are not able to attend uh, school for free in Shenzhen. And so every day they cross uh, the border to the other side. As in-betweeners, they have to negotiate the differences between their citizen rights about where they live, their education, and their health care. And in a way, these two examples describe how these border dynamics initiate emergent flows and economies and begin to coalesce in physical space at the border control points of Lok Mao Chao and Lo Wu. 
The aim is to sort of take advantage of this ambiguous, um, or take advantage of these flows and try and utilize them and harness them and reposition them at one of the border control points. Uh, we chose to work at Long Mao Chao. Uh, Long Mao Chao has an ambiguous sovereign status. Basically, it's a, a, a loop you can see in the bottom right hand corner, a loop of land that was once part of Shenzhen, but because of the straightening of the river, became administered in the Hong Kong side. So since that occurred in the 1990s, Hong Kong and Shenzhen have been debating the future of this piece of land. They've been working towards a cooperative model of development, but it's taken uh, a huge amount of time uh, to try and come up with a solution. What we're interested in is really this idea that the Lot Ma Chao is a type of third space. It's neither Hong Kong nor Shenzhen, but it could harness this dynamic between the cross-border traders and the parallel, uh, and the cross-border children. So our proposal begins to superimpose uh, these location-specific examples between the flows that we've been observing in the fields with the Hong Kong and Shenzhen government's intention to create a new uh, university campus uh, on the site. In this way, the strategy begins to uh, play top-down uh, formal planning against more bottom-up methods, such as the government's uh, small, oh, sorry, such as the government's uh, small house policy. So, so, sort of learning through, um, um, in a way, what Jonathan was observing in some of these land use issues and rights to land that facilitated a type of development pattern in Shenzhen. We're thinking about how can we utilize this as a strategy for the development on this kind of barren piece of mudflat. And one idea was to take on the villages that had once been trapped for development within the uh, frontier closed area and position and give them rights uh, to small house development within uh, the Lot Ma Chao loop. So we coupled this with um, a more formal strategy that would, uh, that would provide the kind of higher education systems that the government were answer, asking for, but also initiating this idea that these villages could build these houses and provide the more informal type of infrastructure, such as shops, student accommodations, in order to facilitate a much more dynamic urban model that was currently being proposed uh, by the government. In this way, we're trying to trigger urban diversity, community building, and also shared resources such as libraries uh, and other types of public facilities that might be uh, catalyzed in this process. The final part of the book uh, begins to attempt to widen the discourse and borders to begin to raise critical issues uh, that are not only relevant to Hong Kong and Shenzhen, but also that might impact the contemporary city. It approaches the city as an urban ecology based on the following concepts. That ecologies work with porosity rather than exclusion. They work with exchange rather than containment and cooperation rather than autonomy. It argues that the increasing polarization of the city and the prevalence of the enclave as a mechanism to organize this uh, segregated and closed model of urbanization produces <coughs> micro borders within the urban realm. So we said if we can learn from our strategies in Hong Kong, can we begin to extract those tactics, those organizations within the diagrams that we have and begin to deploy them on other case sites? The idea is to say given this uh, the contemporary city is beginning to have this increasing number of micro borders to certain tools that we can begin to extract and use them to begin to negotiate uh, different types of uh, territories uh, and conditions uh, from around the world. So the aim really is to create a series of spatial tools to negotiate difference and promote exchange. And these tactics uh, are inherently agile and they're able to adjust to changes in the context and favor temporal shifts over permanent outcomes with the intent to allow the evolution of urban form rather than its stagnation. 
In this way, the design tools that we've derived from the Hong Kong-Shenzhen border can challenge the enclave through the use of ecology as a fundamental approach to designing uh, the city. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm very happy to be here because <clears throat> I know everybody. <laughs> I know Jonathan about eight years ago. At, uh, I think that year you just start the research on the urban village in Shenzhen. I know Joshua in 2007, we worked together uh, as Gay Lauder's curator. And Aidan, the last semester, you gave me two books. Uh, then I learned how you uh, make the research on Hong Kong and Bai Shido. Here I just uh, um, shared uh, the PowerPoint of my uh, class last semester. I, I, I lived and worked in Shenzhen for 10 years from 1989 to 2000, and four years as Shenzhen University student, and six year as uh, cultural workers in the music industry and uh, graphic design industry. And I also work as the chief curator of the Shenzhen Hong Kong Biennale. So I can say I know the city, Shenzhen, very well. I also believe you also uh, know the story about how Shenzhen became a big city from a small uh, fishing uh, uh, village. But today I would like to I talk about something uh, 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 in the pre-Shenzhen pre uh, special economic zone uh, period why Deng Xiaoping decided to found the uh, special economic zone in Shenzhen, and <clears throat> why he selected Shenzhen, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the small village uh, on the Hong Kong uh, borderline to, to found uh, 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 the special economic zone. And then, how is the situation, the organization situation before Shenzhen before uh, Shenzhen become a, a special economic zone. We, I then I pay attention to the third front movement. Uh, and the reason I, I pay attention to this movement because uh, a couple years ago, I, I read a book by Philip Osborne, The Shrinking City Projects. The project's talking about uh, Detroit, New Orleans, uh, Liverpool, Manchester, the, the city in Europe and United States uh, uh, which are thinking, and they are thinking of, is, is China have some city thinking? Then I, 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 I make some research on this movement. So this, this third from movement uh, start from 1964 to uh, 1980. So 1980 is the year uh, when Shenzhen was found. And so the whole movement actually, uh, Deng Xiaoping also worked as uh, the, the uh, main leaders from the central government. He, he was in charge of the, the whole movement. So the, the, the movement because uh, uh, in 1960, in 1960, China was in this Cold War situation. Mao um, Zedong get this uh, coast, the east east coast as the coast uh, front, and then the eastern province uh, along the coast as the second front, and then the south front mean including more than uh, uh, fourteen provinces, including Shanxi, Gansu. Ningxia, Qinghai, Sichuan, Chongqing, Yunnan, Guizhou, 
河北、河南、湖北、湖南、广西，嗯，啊，广西，嗯，嗯，陕西，嗯，山西。So at that time, the China have a very, uh, the the relationship with, uh, Soviet Union was broke up. And then Soviet Union become the main enemy of, of China. So, uh, and from the from the sea, American uh, United States become another main enemy of China because Taiwan uh, at that time had very good relationship with with uh, with United States. So Mao Zedong decided to move most of the the weapon factory from from the northern and eastern to the inner inner land of China. So that 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 is why uh, uh, China has this uh, the third uh, front movement. And and at that time during this movement, uh, the central government invests a lot of funding and set up move a lot of a factory and each factory become then become a, a city. They all, the, the central government also uh, uh, set up more than, uh, it's about 100 research and development I institute. So this is a, a, another kind of organism. Uh, I, I can say it is a very radical organism uh, process because uh, the, the, they build the city in the mountain or, or in the inner, innerland China, uh, just for the national defense reasons. So the third front movement caused the largest human migration in China. Uh, just, I mean, compared to the Shenzhen, it, it, it was almost the same. Shenzhen, when Shenzhen was found, it was also called a, 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 large, a large human migration. So a lot of factory was moved from eastern to northern to the mountain, and those uh, factory uh, and then become a city because those factories should be confidential. They don't have name; they just have number. Nobody know the, what those uh, factory uh, produce. And so all the city or factory is built for political and uh, military purpose. Uh, and the human migra migration was mobilized by the state. And it was, it was a factory century city. It, it is a lot of uh, uh, isolated uh, Danwei unit. Um, and also it was uh, uh, managed in a military grave. It was not production space, but it was po just production space and not consumerism uh, space. And uh, a very typical sample is Tan Zihua City uh, in, in Sichuan province. Just like Shenzhen, it used to be a village because it has a, a very big uh, island mine. Then and the, the central government decided to build an island and steel factory there. And then to shoot the factory, they build uh, everything to, uh, for, for the factory, including the uh, school, hospital, uh, so everything. And then Panzhuhua became a, a city. Uh, it's, I mean, compared to Shenzhen, it's very similar. At that time, Deng Xiaoping uh, working uh, as the uh, three leaders for the uh, front uh, the, the third front movement. But there's no work happened during 1990. So the central government invests a lot of money, they produce a, a, a weapon, um, but at the end of 1980, uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, the central government uh, also uh, take the third uh, front as a, a, a big uh, Ferial. Then, also when Deng Xiaoping uh, visit Shenzhen in 
at the end of 1979, this, uh, there was a very serious uh, phenomenon uh, in, in Shenzhen. There was uh, so many local people, they escaped from Shenzhen to Hong Kong. They, they uh, practiced the swimming by cell chaining and in, in 1952, there's about 100,000 people. In 1957, there was about uh, 50,000 people escaped from uh, Shenzhen to Hong Kong. And in 1979, just before the Shenzhen uh, Special Economic Zone was found, still have 100,000 people uh, escaped from from the mainland China to Hong Kong, including some province from uh, Hunan, from Jiangsu, not only the Guangdong province people. So Deng Xiaoping uh, said, so it was not because the PLA, the People's Liberation Armies, they, not because they did not do a, do a good job, it's because the people who escaped from mainland to Hong Kong, they get they got in rich in Hong Kong, and I think uh, if we want to stop the escape, the escape, we need to develop the economic. And then he designed, Deng Xiaoping designed to uh, to to build a, a, a special uh, economic zone in in Shenzhen, so we can see the connection uh, between the. Uh, the third, the third uh, and uh, Shenzhen special economic zone. Then Shenzhen start become a city, but all the city and factory, a uh, factory in third front, then start uh, sinking, um, and also this uh, very heavy, uh, very very serious uh, depopulation phenomenon happen in those city. This uh, artist Chen Cheng Jia Gang. He took a lot of photos about those uh, factory and, and city, the situation, uh, the depopulation de situation in in the uh, the, the third front uh, area. So you can see the this this uh, uh, military organism, uh, the proposed the political proposed built city, was a bit feral. And the people, a lot of people from this area, they, they left their hometown and then they went to Shenzhen and went to the eastern coast to find a job. So that, <clears throat> so most of this uh, city uh, become uh, empty. There was two films talking about this history. One was by Wang Xiaoshuai, the, the Shanghai Jin, and Zha Zhang Ke's 24 cities. Um, so in the contemporary history of China, I think the Third Front uh, movement was very important. It, it actually, because it was a big failure, it caused the, the open door policy and, and the, the, the funding of the Shenzhen uh, Special Economic Zone. So that was the two book I, I read. And today, in Pan uh, the city, because the depopulation uh, phenomenon was very uh, uh, serious, so the local government want to um, uh, develop the tourism to activate the local economic. One of their, the, the policy is trying to uh, uh, transfer the historical resources of the source front into a tourism uh, content. So they, they want to build a museum of the China South in, uh, in uh, Pan Zihua. So a lot of city was built uh, for the political uh, uh, purpose. Uh, they, there was also another city uh, like Sihezi in Xinjiang actually was, was built uh, uh, from uh, from a, from a no man's land to a, 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 a big city because uh, because the central government, they, they want to build the city uh, for the land uh, defense uh, reasons. And when we look at the history, Shenzhen uh, 
was in the eastern coast, uh, and also um, from Ming Dynasty, the central government of Ming Dynasty already start to build uh, the the watchtower city in Shenzhen, and in uh, in, in Yantai in Shandong province. That was the uh, why they build this watchtower because uh, because of the the coast defense uh, reasons. And then when I work in as the chief curator of Shenzhen Hong Kong Biennale, I I search uh, a lot of the old photo from the local library, and I found this uh, uh, photographer He Huangyou took a lot of photo uh, when Shenzhen was still a fishing village. That was the Luo Hu uh, border, uh, Luo Hu checking uh, check point in uh, 1965. And in the Chung, the, the Sino British Street in 1987, uh, this the, the commercial the business the, the borderline business uh, start uh, be activated. And the main Sen, Senan Avenue was built uh, in uh, 1983. I also collect a photo um, um, the color photos by. Uh, uh, a uh, American guy. I think he was from California. He visited Hong Kong in, in 1980, and he was interested in the small change, the railway system in uh, uh, mainland China. Then he took a one-day trip to Shenzhen and took the photo. You can see from the photo, in 1980, Shenzhen was uh, a sleeping uh, Guangdong style uh, uh, town, uh, people still using the bicycle, and no visitors at that time. And that was, that was a shop, uh, the only shop uh, in, in Shenzhen at that time. And after the this, a special uh, economic zone was found, then the the, uh, the <coughs> Shenzhen have two borderline. The first borderline, the first line is this borderline between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. The second line is the Shenzhen between the mainland and China. And in in two thousand five, uh, I was commissioned by Yang Ho Chang to do a research to participate in his Shenzhen Biennale, and I was interested in the the second line borderline. You know, the the borderline was built uh, along the uh, geography. Uh, it's it's a, a geography night, but Shenzhen, the uh, administ uh, administration uh, district line, is is different from the the, the, the second uh, borderline. Then. Let's say, uh, right here, this is the, the, the second second borderline. But for example, this uh, Longgan district, the Longgan district uh, admin, administration line was like this. Like this. I mean, in this area, it, it belonged to the Longgan uh, district, but it was outside the, the it, was, it was outside the, uh, the, the second borderline, then this area become no man's land. Uh, in Chinese, we call it Cha Hua Di. I, I saw a translation from, from your book, Jonathan. Uh, it was translated as flower arrangement land. <laughs> yes. So because nobody uh, take care of this land, then what did it was a lot of illegal development in, in, in this no man's land. So in 2005, I made a research on, on this uh, no man's land because the illegal building, uh, I was uh, a, a charge and somebody died in, in, uh, in 2004. So, uh, 
And at that time, if you want to enter uh, Shenzhen, you need to have uh, a Shenzhen Special Economic Pass. Uh, so, uh, but but um, when when I was curating Shenzhen Hong Kong Biennale, uh, the, the second line almost just you know the people can enter Shenzhen without uh, the the pass. The pass is a zeroless. But still, on the second uh, lines, you have a lot of trap point. Then every uh, every car or truck, when when they uh, go through this trap point, they have to uh, stop. So the the second border line become um, it's not good for the logistic. And then a lot of people um, and ask to demolish all this trap point and demolish the, the second second line. And okay, Shenzhen um, of course is another uh, uh, purpose built city. And it was also um, a very um, famous arrival city for Chinese people. I, I believe in at the beginning of 19 uh, uh, 80, a lot of uh, Chinese people uh, emigrate from the inner land and they, they realize their dreams in, in China. And it become the arrival city for them. But, but today, uh, the Shenzhen government decided to demolish most of the uh, urban village. You know, urban village actually was a very good place for those people who, uh, when they first, uh, when they moved to Shenzhen, they, especially for, for those in, low income people, uh, they can find a, a, a space in this city. And when Shenzhen government demolished all this urban village, all, so all these uh, low-income immigrant worker, they could not uh, stay in the city. Then Shenzhen was now uh, criticized. Uh, Shenzhen was not a uh, arrival city anymore. And about the urban village, actually, I start the research about urban village uh, in Guangzhou, San uh, Yuanli. Uh, that was. In 2003, I made a documentary about uh, uh, San Yuanli, the urban village in Guangzhou. I think it was the first time that uh, artists uh, to make a show about urban village. So after that, because I present this uh, documentary film and research in Venice Biennale, and then the urban designer and architect uh, pay a lot of attention to the urban uh, village uh, phenomenon. So last semester, uh, okay, I also use the title "Run from the Urban Village." <laughs> so it's a post-planning uh, uh, vision. So we 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 learn from the uh, urban village in Guangdong Province. It is light that gives shade to the architecture instead of the architecture setting rule for life. In the urban village, uh, people they they. Uh, in the urban village, people uh, they build the, ho the, 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 the house uh, according to their life. So when their family size became big, become bigger and they will uh, add, uh, they will uh, build a, additional uh, structure uh, on their house. That was the uh, life give the shape to the architecture, not the architecture uh, set, setting rule for life. And all of the urban village is a traditional roof village. They, there's are so many uh, traditional culture uh, was kept uh, by different gener older generation and younger generation. And also there's a lot of uh, people, they farming on the rooftop. A self-organized society. There's not only, so in the uh, urban village, there's a police uh, station, but also the villagers, they work in as uh, 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 security, uh, they have a security team by themselves. 
Auburn Village is a 24-hour community with uh, energy people. There's a lot of small business. Unnecessarily low cost place for the newcomer in the city and a springboard for life uh, investment and career preferment. So, social mobility vs. Uh, stratum so, solidified, uh, solidification. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I believe uh, Open Village actually uh, uh, can change, can provide a space uh, for the emigrant people and then they can uh, make a living in the city. So last, last year, New York Times have a report about Baisizhou, uh, which uh, Adam also make a research on this village. And um, Dao Saunders uh, criticized Shenzhen was not uh, a rival city anymore. Then in 2007, when Ma Qingyun created the Shenzhen Hong Kong Biennale, uh, he commissioned me to do a research about the second line uh, borderline. So I visited different checkpoints, and I also proposed uh, some uh, to propose uh, uh, in an artistic way to, to uh, transfer the trap point on the second line. Uh, let's say we make some animation. So we transfer a, a trap point in uh, Buji uh, into a hostel, container hostel. Okay, that's all. Uh, so that, that just in a uh, uh, artistic way to uh, just we want to launch this uh, second line issue to the Shenzhen to the general. Ethnographic, but also pulls in um, questions of, of economics and 
land use policy and, and recognizing that you know, architects and uh, urbanists are also um, important actors, uh, as you say. And then um, uh, Joshua's book, which is really about a kind of um, architectural and urban proposals, but in fact um, kind of fundamentally rooted in uh, you know, sort of an understanding of kind of ecological systems and infrastructure and the kind of economies that make it happen. And so um, I, I, I think that's quite a, an interesting sort of parallel or overlap. I think obviously both, all three kind of talks um, dealing with the question of, um, of sort of borders, which uh, needless to say is a um, very topical <laughs> and relevant issue now, um, not only in China, but um, I think all over the world. Um, and uh, you know, the, the kind of, um, the question of, um, I, I think the kind of borders of, so, so many different kind of borders, of course the first line, the second line in Shenzhen, um, but also the kind of the urban villages, which um, Jonathan refers to as a kind of exception within an exception. Um, and um, a, a kind of um, series of uh, sort of, um, I think kind of exacerbated differences, as, as um, Ram calls it in the Harvard project on the city um, a long time ago. So in fact, um, rather than, uh, in a way, kind of creating value by exploiting differences, I think um, being sort of, um, being a kind of key theme um, between all three. So I guess the, maybe just a kind of question then um, is like, um, or a kind of third theme is back to the sort of model, and to what extent, um, you know, to what extent uh, Shenzhen is a kind of model. Um, so, um, Jonathan, you talked about like how uh, kind of all three, a lot of your contributors are um, basically don't don't necessarily take issue with the idea of um, the kind of Shenzhen model, but rather it's kind of uncritical incorporation of events that took place after the fact, right? Um, and um, it, it's funny because when I was reading that, I thought about a lot about kind of in an architecture school like this, we, we work a lot with models, and that, that often happens actually as a kind of creative, um, in, in a way that that's a kind of creative process, in fact. Um, and it's evidence, I think, in, in Shenzhen, um, you know, the idea of first, first it being it was a kind of um, an economic model based on on the one hand, exports and kind of foreign direct investment changing into um, a kind of economic model based on service industries and technology. Um, on the other hand, you know, the kind of urban villages seem at first, I think, um, as uh, something to be kind of erased or removed or kind of a stigma on the city. But then, you know, as Uning has been kind of advocating for a long time, in fact, the urban villages being, in a way, the kind of essence and sort of driver and kind of arrival, the arrival of the city. Uh, the city. Um, and then finally, I think maybe another another um, kind of element, perhaps, of Shenzhen. Originally, the, the sort of the issue of, um, of uh, piracy and copying and the kind of Shanzai phenomenon now being seen as actually a kind of um, a sort of creative impulse. So. I, I'm just kind of, um, I don't know, that's not really a question, actually, but a kind of, um, I guess, the third theme of, of, of the kind of model, so. Um, yeah, maybe you want to react to any of those, any of those points. Uh, But at that time, the narrative I was in a way in, uh, taught actually in school was that the along with Shenzhen, there are a whole bunch of other special economic zones, so founded at the same time. And um, in, in a way, looking back now from my side, that uh, only Shenzhen became something that really that's really something special. So somehow the idea of the Shenzhen model had been copied and the 
so translating into other geographic areas, I wonder if that can be seen as a, a I don't know what's the appropriate word, but it's like a, an impossibility. Uh, uh, maybe Shenzhen's success would be because it's close to Hong Kong. Maybe it has its own unique policy uh, advantages compared to Zhuhai, the city next to Macau, like, for example. Or if you can comment on this. Um, I think it's interesting that in, in the book itself, the, the chapter by uh, uh, Fang Wei Wen, who was the, uh, the chief planner, uh, one of the uh, for Shenzhen, he, he says very clearly that he, he thinks the Shenzhen model cannot be reproduced, that it was, a, it, was a, it was a product of the local time and place and local conditions and can't really be replicated. But um, I think one question is, what is it that's being replicated? Uh, and if you think about the idea of the zone as a political and economic strategy, that has been replicated with tremendous success throughout China. Not all as SECs, but then you have various kinds of different kinds of development zones, high tech zones, this kind of zone, another kind of zone, so that. Uh, after the initial SCZs were created, then there were 14 high-tech development zones up and all along the coast from Dalian down to uh, all the way down uh, to Hainan, and uh, which is one of the original and failed SCZs. Um, and so in a sense, the specifics of Shenzhen could not perhaps be replicated, but the spirit of Shenzhen was replicated. <laughs> um, and that has taken on its own kind of narrative and its own sense of an imaginary, uh, such that um, when you uh, look at some of the literature or talk to people in India who are creating special economic zones, they will often refer to Shenzhen as a model, uh, even if they're not necessarily thinking concretely about the situation uh, on the ground. So, so the answer is, 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 is both that Shenzhen is not a model that can easily be replicated anywhere else, and as an imagination, Shenzhen is a model that has already traveled uh, all around the world. Yeah, no, I think it, you kind of answered your own question. I think that, you know, of course, Hong Kong made an incredible difference, and those kinship networks that I was alluding to as conduits of the money, but also to set up uh, the factories called into uh, Shenzhen area was a key facilitator that enabled uh, the specific context of uh, Shenzhen economic zone to emerge. But I think what's interesting is also that, of course, the, the zone, as Kelly recently obviously points out, is something that is evolving. And recently, you might have heard of Shanghai and in Shenzhen, which is a new formulation of the zone within Shenzhen, which basically recreates the um, economic uh, regulations of Hong Kong uh, within Shenzhen, in the sense that there are certain other incentives that begin to internationalize the uh, RMB, that are centers specifically to attract uh, Hong Kong-based uh, lawyers. So in a way, they're trying to recreate the advantages of Hong Kong within Shenzhen. There's even a store that sells kind of Hong Kong-based goods based in, in uh, Shenzhen. So all these things are kind of countering those dynamics that have been created by that difference between uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen. The logic of exceptionalism is actually what's at, at play in, in this. And, mes and, and these nested exceptionalisms, right? You have the exception, and the exception to the exception, and the exception to that. I wonder what's the sort of extreme version of that. It's, let's say we went to an extreme version of a, a zone that presents itself as extremely porous and open, and uh, then everyone else tries to replicate that. 
everywhere. Then it becomes a sort of flattened, total neoliberal world. Right? Well, I guess you could see zones along a kind of a continuum. Um, I mean, on the one end of the continuum would be really camp-like industrial spaces, similar in some ways to the dirt front uh, uh, attempts, and similar to the early export processing zones that were set up in places like the Philippines that were um, uh, essentially kinds of, uh, of, of farmed camps that, were, that, that could be shut down and relocated uh, when wages rose by companies. And then on the, on the other end of the spectrum, you would have a zone which is essentially a city. So not just a zone that, in, 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 that is completely self-contained and separate, but a zone which is, which is in, indistinguishable from a city. And Shenzhen really is that, in the sense that, uh, to the extent to which the zone uh, nomenclature is relevant, most people going to Shenzhen don't think of it as a zone. Um, they think of it as a city. <coughs> Um, but then you have the way in which cities are adopting this kind of segmentation internally to redefine how cities are built. And in, in a sense, some of the cities in the, in the Emirates are good examples of this, like Dubai, where you have, um, or Abu Dhabi, where you have um, uh, X city, for, I mean, everything is functionally differentiated. Education city, you've got you know, NGO city, you've got media city, you've got everything city, and each of these are almost like their own little zonelet. Uh, so that instead of having really mixed use spaces, you end up with cities that are created out of tiny little zones in, in, in the city. So maybe take it to an extreme, that's, that's sort of what you end up with, is a, is a world that, uh, that's zoned in these. I think, um, I mean, one, that's, I, I completely agree with that, and I think one, one, one kind of question that sort of, when I was there last summer um, with, with some students from here um, at GSAP was like the question of, um, actually the recognition that places like um, Bai Shizhou, you know, or the urban villages in Shenzhen, which have, um, you know, very different, I'm sure as most of you know, very different land ownership structures, density, uh, planning regulations, et cetera, actually precisely because of the kind of contrast and difference um, sustain and facilitate you know, through provision of cheap housing and pseudo informality, sustain the rest of the city from working. So the di in other words, the differences are what, you know, rather than seeing kind of global capitalism as a kind of smoothing, smoothening or leveling everything, it's actually the, the kind of production of differences that are, as you say, generating value. And I think Maybe, maybe to kind of turn that into a question um, for Joshua, like, I, in a way I kind of read the, your border proposal as a sort of, um, as, as a kind of stitching or sort of um, bridging what has been kind of split, actually. And I'm wondering to what extent um, your proposal actually is attempting to kind of bridge or erase differences versus um, kind of, you know, dr uh, drive them or turn up the kind of contrast? I think we were, we were quite conscious on the one hand not to try and create an overarching strategy that formally looked like we were stitching the border together. But we were trying to understand the specific flows or observations from the different uh, characteristics that were existing along the border in order to begin to harness uh, or an idea of a kind of tactical move within the site. So the sense is that it's, it moves away from an, uh, a singular end, but it tries to catalyze uh, multiple possibilities through these, what are in effect kind of devices. In some cases, we, we try and uh, increase the contrast, you know, in terms of uh, creating more of these kind of abandoned conditions. And here in the case of the kind of Long March Island, example. In other cases, we are dealing with these specific differences. But one thing that we learned quite quickly is that a lot of the projects were actually dealing with what's happening in Hong Kong. Of course, using uh, uh, the vehicle of Shenzhen to begin to inform what was happening in Hong 
economy is just very much sided towards uh, the FCA and the frontier closed area itself. Question, uh, uh, Jonathan. I, I was surprised uh, in your book. Um, there is no uh, access about the copy, the citizen model, huh? um, because a couple of years ago I heard this, the uh, China central government really they want to uh, copy the citizen special economic model to Africa. So, but it seems the, there's a lot of NGO in Africa they refused this model then it seemed it, it, it did not happen. And I think that's, that was interesting, uh, I mean, for your book, learning from Sun Chen. Yeah, I mean, in the book, we restricted ourselves very much to Shenzhen itself. Um, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there could be a sequel, <laughs> which looks at Shenzhen outside of Shenzhen, in all of the different imaginations in India and Africa. Uh, in the way that it is uh, appropriated and, and, and deployed as a as a um, as a as a trope or as a shorthand, uh, I mean there are special economic zones in Africa, and China has been involved in building some of them. Um, our side of Rwanda is one, there's several others, but they um, it's hard to say to what extent that it, and it goes back to your question: is it a, is it is it Shenzhen as being model, or is it this idea of the the, the exceptional space with all the tax uh, benefits and everything else that comes with it. Um, and, uh, and what was really very unique to Shenzhen, um, even in the case of other Chinese cities, um, is that it was, uh, it was a, well, you know, Baoan County was, was elevated to uh, an urban designation um, so suddenly um, and thus all the rural areas literally found themselves in the middle of the city by decree. Um, and, uh, and, and, and thus, um, it's hard even in China to replicate the role of the uh, urban or urbanized villages in other cities. Um, because in other cities, in established cities, when the cities will expand, they will start to encompass uh, villages that were originally on the outskirts or even further away from the city. But in Shenzhen, they're in the center of the city. Uh, and, 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 and because of the quirk that, um, that in the early days they were still the, the former farm, former collective village farms and, and town and village enterprises were left under rural land law uh, while the area around it was un under urban land that created this very stark uh, difference that could be exploited in various ways, planned or unplanned. Um, whereas, uh, to, to the extent I can tell, in, 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 in more contemporary cases where a city like Chongqing is going to expand its, or Hangzhou expands its, uh, its, its urban uh, de uh, municipality, um, they, they don't make the mistake, I guess, um, that Shenzhen made, if you want to look at it that way, of leaving the former villages um, under the rural land law. They immediately incorporate them into the urban, the urban as they get the people who call it. Um, and that way, um, uh, they kind of um, make it less possible to recreate the types of situations that you had in the early days of Shenzhen. So, so in that sense, the Shenzhen model exists as an idea much more than back to your question really than as a, uh, as a replica of uh, reality. Um, Did you see the... Lord Machao, um, for example, the parallel trading I know has been causing a lot of conflicts uh, between Shenzhen and Hong Kong with regards to things like milk powder shortage and stuff like that. And I was wondering if in your proposal, you sort of had a way of dealing with the social aspect of the border crossing in terms of creating a zone where maybe people could, I don't know, just a way of easing that burden, maybe sort of economic and also social that exists between these two groups. Yeah, that was the idea. It was rather. Uh, a lot of the issues that we think come from, we try not to solve directly as a kind of problem solution. 
uh, type model. So we try and understand what's going on and suggest strategies where uh, some of those conditions could actually be taken advantage of. And in a certain way, it goes back to uh, the idea of the village uh, was able to take advantage of those conditions to have a more, you know, let's say, fair, looser regulation uh, about land development. So what we're trying to do in the Rock Monticello example is couple that with the sort of notion of this kind of more top-down planning model, which is you know, very hierarchical, which is about bringing in the institutions uh, from the government, and then contrasting with that uh, looser regulation for um, uh, village housing, so it becomes much more sporadic. And in that tension, or in that kind of productive tension, or in that possible exchange, then some of those ideas for um, the power of traders that begins with having the shop fronts of those houses. But then the status in between the citizens, um, there's 150 people that are allocated that can be, have their uh, are applying to have a bond in, um, in Hong Kong, and need 150 per year. So can we find a way to begin to allocate those in between the families? So if you uh, you know, if you have a child from uh, DRC citizen in Hong Kong, you, one of your parents has to live in China. Right? So for that population, in between the population, can we seek sites within that border area? to actually allow them to be housed. So the villagers that live in Hong Kong can have an advantage because they can build a house and then rent it out to people. The people from the other side can actually have right to vote in this kind of third zone of status. And there could also be sites for these parallel traders to also take root and allow this non-dead uh, space that's usually produced by top-down planning to begin to activate in the same way that we see in the urban villages as a much, much more The, the border is a really fascinating case in so many different ways. And one of the others that I'm interested in is, and visually, I mean, for those of you who know the, the, the border, um, or for those of you who don't know the border, um, it, you have the, 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 the massive city of Shenzhen stopping, you know, and then right on the other side of the river is you know, just green. <laughs> uh, countryside. Um, and of course, one of the concerns, a double concern, I mean, one is um, that, um, that uh, without um, a, an adequate uh, concept that you're trying to develop, you're just going to have the same kind of development on the Hong side of the border that you have on Shenzhen. And you, you have this very ecologically valuable um, green space. Um, and then the other is that there's a lot of uh, dumping going on uh, uh, in, 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 the, in, in this border land, which, um, so, so there's the fear of development, and there's the fear of leaving it empty. And I was wondering if you could maybe think that, talk about the environmental aspect. Yeah, and I think one thing that the, the planning authority is obviously aware of the issues, but it kind of chickened out because it said, all right, let's just go around the recreation and they zoned it for recreation, which is a very ambiguous term. Because so the conservationists and the environmentalists are unhappy because it's not conserved enough. And the villagers and the developers are unhappy because they can't move forward with any development. So the designation of recreation is actually an important designation because it means that people take advantage of it. So it allows for people to dump. It allows for people to put their containers on it or start um, small businesses. And there's a very famous legal case, the Mojave case, which said, as a villager, we have right to the land. So whether you designate it conservation or if I'm going to do what I want with my land, and just dumping uh, steel bars on it, and that became law. So now we have this kind of scarring of this landscape by villagers who are doing it for purely economic reasons. So that's why you get this very strange pothole of a landscape that begins to appear. So again, that comes out of saying, well, how can we begin to intervene, or how can we begin to find methods that could 
strategically say that you know, that M form of development is just that we have environmental conditions and that rich ecology just gets destroyed. So we're trying to, in the scarred landscapes chapter, it's about trying to instrumentalize a zoning policy that can bring about a certain amount of remediation, but that remediation uh, then comes at a cost. So you say, okay, you can do whatever you want in your land as long as you remediate. So you try and control a staged process of occupation and of kind of biological remediation over time, but still not saying you can't do those economic things that you wanted to do. So we're trying to introduce ways to think of different speeds of temporal, uh, so different temporal occupations of the land, so that it is not just conservation or development. So there's something that we can begin to navigate and implement between those two. Should we take uh, one last question? As much as I'm very sympathetic to Joshua's pressure, I think um, relating to what um, this <laughs> uh, relating to what he just asked, I think like um, for instance the, 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 the problem with the milk powder and with like you know um, children who have parents who one of them being a um, um, PRC citizen and the other being a Hong Kong citizen. I think part of the problem is also just simply the problem of citizenship. Um, so if you designate like a zone um, in that, um, that green area that's not being used right now for um, parents and children like that, for families like that, like what kind of citizenship they can hold, you know? Because I think right now what China and Hong Kong is facing is very much not just the problem with um, space and borders, but also um, a lot of people from Hong Kong, they basically hold a double citizenship um, in the sense that they're both um, a citizen of China, maybe not so much, but mostly they're under the laws and governance of the Hong Kong government, which is a, a total different ideological and uh, legal system. So. I wanted to spend touch point that in your book. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we definitely recognize that it's an issue. Uh, obviously, uh, as a Hong Kong citizen, you can get your return home card, which it's called, right? the return home card, which you can have access, of course, to the rest of the, the mainland. But as a Shenzhen citizen, then you don't have those rights. There used to be a law that allowed every Shenzhen who go to go to travel to Hong Kong whenever they liked. But they curtailed that in 2015, and they limited it to just once a week. So constantly the, 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 the PRC government and the Hong Kong government are constantly changing the designations of those rights of citizenship. It happens all the time. So in a way we're saying, given that that's how government decisions are made, that reacting to certain things or certain political opinions. Right? In 2015, the reaction was pretty much because of the umbrella uh, you know, revolution and because there was much more inbuilt hostility from some Hong citizens towards uh, mainland Beijing and to China. And so they stopped and limited the amount of access into Hong Kong. So I guess what we're saying is we're playing into that, saying constantly this access or this designation of what rights you have as a citizen could actually play into our, into our strategy. And to think of the Love My Child Loop, which is already has this ambiguous sovereign status, right? That it is Shenzhen land officially within the legal designation of Hong Kong. Isn't that an opportunity to give those people who are caught between these citizen status to give them the opportunity and rights to have access to this area and to take advantage of their, their status in a different way. Which sounds like a color war city. Yeah. 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 A greener. Yeah. <laughs>